This is our ancestor, two billion years ago, a simple cell, but pretty much like us, to live in its oxygen, food, and water from its environment. And then it rejects CO2 that is used then by other organisms. So it lives in symbiosis, a relation that benefits both. Since then, well, we've been evolving quite a lot, I guess. We are made of billions of cells. And we've been evolving for all this time through one single mechanism, natural selection. To put it simply, some random mutations are happening all the time. And some of them happen to provide us an advantage, like being able to climb trees, for example. So uh, you get more food, you avoid predators. So, in the end, it increases your likelihood to survive and therefore to reproduce. So those mutations and the corresponding characteristics will be spread through whole populations. And one day, everybody will be able to climb trees. For two billion years, our environment, or more precisely, all the species, the millions of species composing our environment, has been evolving for, uh, through the same, exactly the same mechanism of natural selection meaning that it has been able to adapt to our own evolution and vice versa. So we have been co-evolving all this time. And this kept us in symbiosis, in natural symbiosis. So we've been living in a mutually beneficial relationship. And then, two million years ago, something happened. Something uh, called technology, starting with simple tools made out of uh, stone, and then control the fire over uh, one million years ago. And until today, or in the past centuries, where we went through several industrial revolutions, it allowed us to dramatically improve our standard of living. Through the past centuries, industrial revolutions alone, we tripled our life expectancy, which I think we all agree is it's really great. But in the same time, our environment has been evolving through the same old natural selection, much more slowly. So, at some point, it couldn't cope anymore with our really fast, quickly growing impacts. And our relationship shifted towards parasitism, where one lives at the expense of the other. I think you all know that already, but we are using every year twice the amount of resources our planet can produce. We are triggering the sixth global extinction, climate change, well. And we are, even today, when we talk about nature, not really including us in this nature. So it's, I mean, it's pretty weird. But I don't want to focus on that because, I mean, we hear that over the news all the time. Actually, what I'm quite excited about is more what's next. And that's what I want to talk about. Well, it cannot keep going like that forever, actually. Yeah, it's in clickants. So we have three options, three. The first one, uh, we go back to live like cavemen. Second one, the human population go through a steep decrease, whether it's voluntary or not. And third option, well, we fix it. Technology that has been responsible until today for uh, creating a gap with our environment is actually used to close this gap. And it leads us to a new era that, uh, so it, it, it restores this coevolution and symbiosis again, but a new kind of symbiosis that we call engineered symbiosis because it's enabled by technology. Actually, what's, I mean, What's really interesting is that it's really happening. It's, it's, it's already happening. I don't know if you, if you are aware of that, but we are really entering today in, in really exciting times, in, the, in, a, in a new era of, of uh, innovation. For the, 30, for the last 30 years, innovation has been mainly driven by um, internet, uh, computing power, mobile, but today, 
we are seeing the emergence of really, really powerful technologies. You heard a lot about artificial intelligence already, 3D printing, and also in biotech. We are now finding new ways to uh, engineer DNA, which is really at the core of life itself. So those really powerful technologies that we call deep tech have the potential to shift entire industries. And that's what I've been focusing my life to over the last few years with, uh, with Hello Tomorrow. We have been trying to make sure that this incredible potential is transformed into real concrete solutions. And really, I mean, the good news is it's, there are some, like many solutions. It's already happening. This transition is already happening. So let me give you a few examples. For example, let's consider the way we eat. The way we've been producing food has been responsible for a large part of the current situation, climate change and so on. And in particular, the way we grow meat has a big impact, a big negative impact. And it's been, actually, it's been the same for uh, forever, actually. Uh, we've been growing meat on animals. And uh, it's not efficient. I mean, we use more than 80% of farmlands to grow meat, I mean, to breed animals, but it's only uh, responsible for less than 20% of the calories. And on top of that, some might add that it is cruel. But today, we have a radically new way of growing meat. Look at this burger. It's been cooked by Memphis meat, or more interestingly, the meat inside, us, inside it has been grown by Memphis meat in a lab. So basically, they took some uh, cells from uh, muscle tissue and they developed it. They grown it in petri dishes in a lab. And tomorrow, they will do that in meat factories. And it is already happening. And another startup called Finless Food is doing that with fish meat. And while we're talking about animal, here's another issue. Every year, in the US alone, 100 million animals are killed to test new uh, chemicals, new drugs, new cosmetics, which is, I mean, it is very important. Well, today we are replacing animal testing by something called organ on a chip. Well, it's a weird name. What does it mean, organ on a chip? So uh, basically, um, it's using the manufacturing methods to produce traditional computer chips and involving other technologies like microfluidics to design devices that replicate exactly the same microstructure and functions as human organs. So this one, it's actually neurons on a chip. So what you can do with that is that you can test new drugs, for example, but you don't need to inject that in the brain of an animal. You don't need to use animal to test it. You can just do, use this device. And not only does it allow to avoid using and killing animals, but it's also much more efficient because this device can be industrialized while animal testing can't. Well, there are, I have hundreds of other examples showing that really technology today helps us to decrease our impact on the environment. But what's also interesting is that it is so powerful today that it allows also to boost the environment's capacity to restore itself, to uh, cope quickly enough to our growing impact. Look at this picture. This is a mushroom. This is mycelium. It has a unique capacity to absorb pollutants. And a company called Novobiome is using this unique capacity to uh, depollute soils rather than using traditional techniques like um, heating or adding even more chemicals. And I told you about how now we are able to engineer life engineer life at its core. Well, imagine if you're able to engineer those mycelium, th those mushrooms, to actually be able, at a large scale, to um, decontaminate any soil. And this is done today, I mean, helping the environment restore itself at the global scale. Let's consider deforestation. A startup that's called uh, 20 Trees is today using um, Earth observation data 
So meaning all the pictures taken by satellites that have a, a very high resolution. And then artificial intelligence to uh, analyze this huge amount of data. If you imagine, um, I mean, data of the forest over the whole planet that will probably take centuries uh, to analyze that with a technology. And by doing that, they are able to map the forest and, and identify where it needs spatial care or where we need to plant trees. And to plant those trees, again, an innovation uh, brought by a company called Biocarbon Engineering allows to use drones and plant trees in areas where we might not be able to go and anyway, uh, at least doing it much faster. So they're, they're able to plant trees by going with a drone and then shooting seeds with compressed air. So they plant trees at a fraction of the cost and of the time that humans could do with the technology. So in the end, this technology that in its early stage, in its uh, early phase until today, has been responsible for creating a gap between us and our environment, today is reversing the trend. And by both allowing us to decrease our impact, but also to supercharge our environment's capacity to, to adapt, is really restoring a new symbiosis. Uh, and is really making us enter into this new engineered symbiosis era. But if you consider artificial intelligence that allows us to map the forest at a global scale, well, it's the, actually the same technology that allows some countries to track their own, whole population, to control the whole population. And if you consider also uh, how we propel satellites in space, so how we connect the whole humanity together, well, that is the same technology that allows us to create nukes and nuclear en energy powering humanity also relies on the same technology to create atomic bombs that you can put in those nukes. So, in the end, technology always can lead to many different paths. And progress is not a story that is already written and that we just need to, to discover. It's a succession of many choices that we do every day as a society or as individuals. So how do we make sure that those choices lead us to the future we want? Well, first we need to know what we want, or at least where we want to go, because nobody knows what the future will look like, or those who tell you they know, they are definitely lying. So that's what we're doing also with Hello Tomorrow. We're uh, building on all the startups we meet. We define some possible scenarios, some vision of our future, and this engineered symbiosis is definitely one of them. And then we turn to companies, because those are the ones who uh, innovate, who transform technologies into concrete products and solutions and bring them to the market. And they need to be able to understand and embrace those visions and their shareholders need to be able to bet on the long term because shifting entire industries won't happen overnight. It won't happen over a quarter of a year neither. And then naturally we look at governments too because those are the ones who fix the rules by which companies are playing. And if they don't work hand in hand, if they don't look at the future together, then one, th one thing is certain they will all act in their own interest, or at least, or maybe in the interest of their own population. But the sum of those egoistic behaviors will lead us to a situation which would be far from the optimal scenario for everybody. And ultimately, it's up to you, it's up to us, the billion of people who every day make choices that influence those companies and those governments. Every time we vote, every time we buy something, well, we make a choice and it has an influence. So let's use this power and let's choose our future. Thank you. <laughs>